Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. The U.S. is seeing cases of the U.K. variant of COVID-19 appear throughout the country, and now New York is reporting its first case in Saratoga Springs. Big Fox News' Matt Kleindon spoke with local health officials about the spread of the new virus strain. He joins us from Corning. Good evening. The U.K. variant of the coronavirus is said to be more contagious than the original strain. With the first case being reported in upstate New York, health officials say they expect more cases to be moving towards the southern tier. The first case of the new COVID strain was found in a man in his 60s associated with this jewelry store in Saratoga Springs. Governor Cuomo stated the man had not traveled to the UK, suggesting it was a case of community spread. So that confirms what many experts have been saying, that this virus has been uh, spreading around the U.S. for a little while now. Given the nature of the U.K. variant, Dr. Joseph Scopaletti of Guthrie says we could see more cases throughout the state. More people are exposed, more people contract COVID. Um, and um, uh, so that means there'll be more people who are potentially in need of care. While the new strain doesn't appear to be more deadly than the original virus, Dr. Scopaletti says that he's expecting more hospitalizations because of the increased spread. While Guthrie has the capacity to handle more cases, he says it's now on residents to continue following COVID protocols to keep the spread down. The fact that the virus is more contagious reinforces the need for people to be cautious. Social distancing, wearing a mask, limiting travel, limiting gatherings are all really important now uh, so that we don't overwhelm the healthcare systems. Matt Kleindens, Big Fox WYDC Corning. The U.S. reported more than 180,000 new COVID-19 patients on Monday. Johns Hopkins University released its final tally for January 4th today. According to the new numbers, health officials identified at least 180,000 and 477 new COVID-19 patients Monday. That means more than 20,817,000 cases have been confirmed in the U.S. since the start of the pandemic. Johns Hopkins also reported that 1,903 people died from COVID complications. That brings the total U.S. death toll from the virus to 353,483. The Corning Center is now distributing the COVID vaccine to its residents and staff. This comes after the nursing home dealt with a massive outbreak back in September. Pharmacists from Walgreens delivered 165 doses of the vaccine, which covers about 80% of residents. About a third of staff members were also vaccinated. People living in one Massachusetts city are receiving a gift from their city. That gift? New face masks. But this gift is much more than it meets the eye. Wale Aleyu has more on how the city hopes the masks will slow the spread of COVID-19. Walk around the city of Everett and you'll notice people with all kinds of different masks on. But there's one mask you'll start to see more and more. Did you know it was coming? No. What was your reaction when you saw that? I didn't really know what it was. I just opened it and I just thought it was a nice thing to do, I guess, for people that didn't have their own masks. That would be a really good idea. The presents began arriving around Christmas, two per household on the city census list. And the reusable cotton masks weren't from Santa, but the city. Today, you know, you have a daily positive rate of never at a 12.6% with 11th highest in the state. Um, we just uh, really want to bring a, bring some some great attention to the fact that you can still live your life as normal normally as possible, but when you are unable to socially distance yourself from others, wearing a mask reduces your transmission rate. It wasn't just a thoughtful Christmas present for the 30,000 households, but also for the local business the city hired. You know, they called me. They wanted to know if I was interested in 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 uh, giving them a price, which I did. It was actually perfect timing for me. You know, it was a big order. Um, and it basically helped me keep my employees working and also, you know, switch to full time to finish out the year. And the gift continues giving. Residents don't just get a mask, but educational material as well. Oh, I saw the little tag, yeah. That tag, a QR code for testing information and other resources. Everyone's using it, so it's just like we should put this on the mask so people can also... Um, use their phones and, and get all information that they need at their fingertips. I just think they're trying to be helpful in ways that they can, kind of doing what they can. Election Day is here again in Georgia. But this runoff election for two Senate seats will affect all 50 states and the end result will be a major factor for the incoming Biden administration. John Lawrence reports. 
Voters in Georgia will determine Tuesday which party will control the U.S. Senate. Are you ready to show America that Georgia's a red state? Republican Senators Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue got a presidential boost less than 12 hours before the polls opened. Kelly fights for me, David fights for me, that I can tell you. Before the rally in Dalton, Georgia, both announced they will oppose the Electoral College's certification of President-elect Joe Biden's victory. He may not know it yet, but Donald Trump is leaving. Democratic candidates John Ossoff and the Reverend Raphael Warnock also received high-profile support in Atlanta on Election Day Eve. By electing John and the Reverend, you can make an immediate difference in your own lives, the lives of the people all across this country. If Ossoff and Warnock both win, the Senate will be split with Vice President-elect Kamala Harris holding the tie-breaking vote. This political showdown in Georgia comes days after Trump pushed Georgia's Secretary of State in a recorded phone call to change the results of the 2020 presidential election. It wasn't the right call. He shouldn't have made the call to begin with and certainly shouldn't have had that dialogue. It's a call for a coup with a gavel instead of a rifle. I'm John Lawrence reporting. Congress goes gender neutral. Each two-year session has to abide by certain rules, and the language for the session that just started this week gets rid of gender identity. As Mike Emanuel reports, gender is not the only thing being tossed out the window. The House is now in order. <laughs> the Democrat-led House kicked off the 117th Congress with new rules removing gender. On page five of the 45-page package, strike chairman and insert chair. On page six, strike father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister, husband, wife, father-in-law or mother-in-law, and insert parent, child, sibling, spouse, or parent-in-law. And then strike himself or herself and insert themselves. The House Democratic Caucus chair was asked about the new language. Gender neutral language is just consistent to reflect the gorgeous mosaic of the American people in the most sensitive fashion possible. Eternal God. It even made its way into the prayer on the opening day of Congress. A man and a woman. The House Republican leader says striking gender is absurd. I'm a proud father. I'm an extremely proud son. But we're gonna strike him from the rules. You changed the word to all men that has nothing to do with gender? But that's not the only irritant for House Republicans. There's a change to deficit controls on legislation like Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. It makes reforms to our budget rules so that we can deal with these dual challenges through an all-hands-on-deck approach while maintaining fiscal responsibility. Up until now, lawmakers were required to find new revenue sources or spending cuts to fund their priorities. It also changes the motion to recommit, a tool Republicans have effectively used to force Democrats to take tough votes. This Soviet-style rules package, it is all designed to take away the voice of 48 percent of this House chamber. The truth is Republicans were never going to like the rules package. It's part of the frustration of being the minority party since the other party has the power and runs the House. The rules package passed on a party-line vote 217 to 206. In Washington, Mike Emanuel, Fox News. Countless Americans are finally able to breathe a sigh of relief after the second round of stimulus checks. From paying rent to buying groceries, the money will help those hardest hit by the pandemic fulfill some of their needs. But many people who aren't strapped for cash right now are choosing to use their checks to give back. Jackie Ibanez has that story. As stimulus checks slowly roll out across the country, many Americans not living paycheck to paycheck are left wondering, how should I spend the money? Activist Christopher Nicholson says if you could afford to ask this question, consider donating all or part of your check. He's the creator of the Check for Good campaign, which encourages people who have disposable income to give back to those who have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Each donation is important because it's not only going to have an immediate impact on a person or an organization, um, but additionally, it's going to signal that our system is pretty broken and we need to 
uh, be able to invest in building a more equitable future. On the Check for Good site, you can either choose to support an emergency fund that provides immediate relief to people such as restaurant workers or undocumented immigrants, or you can donate to organizations dedicated to systemic change such as racial justice or education reform. Nicholson initially launched the campaign in the spring when the first round of stimulus checks were given out. Now, he's hoping for an even better turnout as the pandemic continues to lay bare the nation's inherent inequalities. This pandemic did not create the problems of wealth inequality. This pandemic did not create racial injustice. This pandemic exacerbated those things and exposed those things to a level that we've never seen before. If you want to participate in the Check for Good campaign, all you need to do is go to forwardequality.org. Jackie Banez, Fox News. Still ahead tonight, when the COVID-19 vaccine becomes available to everyone, you may be wondering if it's right for you. The CDC says you shouldn't get the shot if you're allergic to the components in these vaccines, which you can review on the vaccine's product labels. More on what medical experts are advising Americans looking to receive the vaccine ahead. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox. Now, your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. Tonight's Big Fox forecast is brought to you by William Matar. Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Kim Walker with your weather update. More snow to be had as we head into your Wednesday. But as the low pressure system that is bringing the snow starts to depart the region, we are expecting all this snow to really taper off for tomorrow. A few flurries will remain from Corning all the way to Hornell. But overall, I think we're going to be left with a lot of cloud cover and a lot of cold air that will stick around through the end of the week. Our future radar is showing for tonight. Notice just a few flurries popping up near Bath and also in uh, Corning. And this will expand, so there could be a few isolated showers, snow showers, that is, as we head into tomorrow. It looks like uh, Elmira, Sayer, you could see a few snow showers there. Hornell, maybe a few flurries that will be uh, popping up early in the morning, but it looks like by noon tomorrow, most of this activity will be gone as that low pressure system exits the region. So here's a look at your forecast. So we're going to have to do a little bit of shoveling, maybe just half an inch for tonight into most of the day tomorrow. So not a lot of shoveling that we have to do uh, because I know any snow that we have out there is pretty much uh, shoveled away. Temperatures will start off around 31 degrees. It's going to feel like 27 degrees with a few flurries out there as well. Dreary conditions, lots of clouds during the day at around 10 o'clock. Our temperature readings barely above freezing at 33 degrees, 34 by 2 o'clock. And it looks like we'll stay in the low 30s near that freezing mark throughout the day. But it's going to feel like the 20s just because there's going to be a breeze. And I emphasize just a slight breeze at around 5 miles per hour. But that's going to cause those temperatures to feel just a little bit cooler. But throughout the afternoon, those clouds will stick around. And it's going to stick around for uh, much of the day on Thursday as well. But high pressure will start to build in. That's going to dry things out, and so we're going to see a little bit of sunshine, maybe some peaks of sunshine, but those clouds are really going to be thick. We have another storm system that will be approaching, but it looks like this time it's going to stay well to the south, so I really don't think we're going to see any rain or any snow out of this system for the end of the week, and we're going to see a dry spell, so that's good news there. Temperatures tonight dropping down to around 27 degrees in Corning. 31 in Elmira, 27 in Perkinsville, scattered snow showers tonight, a few flurries tomorrow, but most of this activity again will be winding down. 36 degrees in Corning, 35 in Elmira, Mansfield around 36 degrees and cooler in Perkinsville at 31 degrees. So it looks like tomorrow is going to be the warmest day of the rest of the week. So we drop down to around 33 degrees with low clouds on Thursday, below freezing on Friday. And we're going to stay below freezing until about Sunday afternoon. And we're going to be barely above freezing with a high of 33 degrees, but we should see a little bit more sunshine.
As more coronavirus vaccines roll out, you may be wondering whether to get vaccinated when it becomes available to you, especially if you're pregnant, nursing, or immunocompromised, or have allergies. Mandy Gaither has more on what medical experts advise in today's Health Minute. Two coronavirus vaccines currently have the green light in the U.S. The first is Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccine, two shots given 21 days apart. This one is recommended for anyone 16 years and older. The second is Moderna's vaccine, again two shots, but this one is given 28 days apart and is recommended for those 18 and over. Research is still being done to determine whether these vaccines are safe for children and younger teens. If you're pregnant, you can choose to get the vaccine but you should know that these vaccines were not extensively studied in pregnant women. So there's limited safety data to look at for that group. On the other hand, COVID-19 itself poses a risk for pregnant women. The CDC says that some women who contract COVID-19 are at an increased risk of severe illness and might also be at an increased risk for having a preterm birth. Both Pfizer and Moderna created mRNA vaccines, which aren't thought to be harmful for a nursing child, according to the CDC. For those who are immunocompromised, you may choose to get the vaccine, but these vaccines were not substantially studied for your underlying health condition. So there's not enough data on how safe they are or how effective they are yet. On the other hand, getting infected with COVID-19 can be risky for people with compromised immune systems. For those with allergic reactions, the CDC says you shouldn't get the shot if you're allergic to the components in these vaccines, which you can review on the vaccine's product labels. A new mural is up in Nashville in honor of the heroes of the Christmas morning bombing. The design highlights the six police officers who saved lives that day. Tosin and Fakel talked to the group who helped make it. Our designer just came up with this beautiful mural uh, and then we knew we had to paint it somewhere. So we wanted to get as close as we could to the bomb site while still being safe. The faces of those six officers now here on the street where they work to evacuate people before that explosion. I took three different pieces of plywood. If you look closely, you'll be able to see them. Uh, and they painted it at a studio here in town and then brought it here and installed it on the existing uh, plywood that was here. The mural is at the Hard Rock Cafe, sitting in a boarded up window that was destroyed during the explosion. Once the window is fixed, they're actually going to hang it up inside and frame it forever so that the heroes can always be remembered here. Tim with I Believe in Nashville says their brand is about the community. For us, the community is also the officers that risk their lives, and so we wanted to have something that would honor them and a way for them to know that we, we appreciate their sacrifices. This week, purchases from the company will go to this Second Avenue community. 100% will be donated to Marcus Lemonis' 30-day um, Nashville Fund, which helps provide grants for small businesses, and Music City Inc., which is the Visit Music City Fund, which actually puts gift cards in the hands of impacted individuals. Christmas treats came a little later for some wounded service members and their families in Honolulu. Over the weekend, a nonprofit held a traditional holiday gala. But as Jolene Martinez reports, the event was held as a drive through because of the pandemic. <laughs> Seeing those little kids with their smiles is heartwarming. It made it all worthwhile. Season greetings from Disney favorites and a welcome from the Christmas Grinch himself. I fly. To wounded warriors and their families who were showered with gifts and holiday cheer as they drove by the First Presbyterian Church in Kaneohe. I feel like these families have sacrificed so much. And so this is just a small way that we can give back to them, especially during this this pandemic time. Everyone kind of gets a little depressed if things aren't going so well with the pandemic and so forth. But these 70% of our clients suffer from PTSD, post-traumatic st stress syndrome. And you know, th this kind of a thing lifts their spirit. Happy holidays. 41 families from all branches of the military were presented with gift cards from local businesses, a family game, and sweet treats. Over 80 kids received gifts from Toys for Tots and Iolani School's Raiders for Wounded Warriors. It's really heartwarming to see how much they supply for families that can't exactly get anything right now. And while the gala was different this year, the families are grateful for the nonprofit helping to keep their spirits up as we enter this new year. It's all about the morale and um, giving hope to families and children and neighbors and communities. So thank you. This is hope.
Employees at Google have launched a new trade union. It's called the Alphabet Workers Union, and so far, it has more than 225 engineers and other workers as members. Unions are rare in Silicon Valley, and tech companies have traditionally frowned upon them. Google's new union, though, isn't traditional. It has no collective bargaining power and cannot negotiate salaries. Instead, the union will likely tackle issues like business practices and ethics. If you have a Samsung smartphone, listen up. The electronics giant is expected to unveil its latest Galaxy S21 smartphone next week. This was the invite sent to the media. You can see a smartphone inside a cube with the title, Welcome to the Everyday Epic. Word is we'll see the phone at Samsung's Unpacked event on January 14th, which is about a month earlier than its typical February showing. The new year is looking bright for a Minnesota diner after a very dark period. The establishment nearly closed until patrons stepped in to save it. Boyd Huppert reports. As her diner sat closed, the bills piling up. Yeah. The granddaughter of the founder of Mickey's was struggling. Like, what would my grandfather tell me to do? How do you navigate this? Melissa Matson has since learned Sorry. Her family's little diner will not enter 2021 alone. Everyone loved this place. Everyone. Apparently so. In a flurry of New Year giving, $67,000 collected, blowing past a $50,000 goal, mostly small donations for more than 1,900 people. It's, it's truly amazing. It's, it's emotionally overwhelming. Silver bells. Payback for eight decades of 24-7 service to customers like these. Last Christmas I was here too. Spending Christmas Eve 2001 at Mickey's. I haven't seen my mom uh, or my dad uh, for Christmas in four years now. Relief, relief. Uh, as you say, that there's also the sense of obligation though that I feel like now I've, I've got an obligation to a lot of people. Patient vendors can now be paid. And atop the dining car, a neon sign that went dark during COVID can now be repaired to again light St. Peter and West 7. I personally felt like there was hope, not just for us, but just for everyone who was donating. Hope that we're going to see a return to normalcy, that we're going to get through this. Still plenty of challenges in the era of social distancing for a 36-seat cheek-to-cheek diner. But Mickey's reopening is now assured with payback on the menu. Thank you for all the generosity, and we look forward to seeing and serving you soon. Well, we want to leave you with a smile tonight. You've probably heard people call 2020 a dumpster fire, so it only makes sense that one Florida fire department ended the year by responding to an ironic last call, an actual dumpster fire. <laughs> As they were counting down to the new year, Brevard County firefighters were called out to an actual dumpster on fire. They put it out, no one was hurt, but the department says it kind of sums up 2020. The firefighters even took a picture by the dumpster after putting out the flames. Here's to 2021. From our whole team, thank you for joining us. We hope you have a great night.